in the next 90 minutes, we will have um, speakers from each of these organizations give talks about specific aspects and topics within neural rendering. After a short introduction, um, which I will be giving, um, we will start by introducing the technical foundations of neural rendering. So what do you actually need to make neural rendering work from a technical perspective? And Ayush from MPI um, will give a talk about that. Afterwards, we will talk about all the cool applications neural rendering is even enabling already today. And we will have different talks about the different applications that are enabled. Um, so Junyan will start talk, talking about semantic photo editing um, using neural rendering. Then we will have Vincent from Stanford um, talking about novel view synthesis. So how you can synthesize novel views of a scene um, based on these techniques. Then we will have a short break, um, five minutes, so everybody can grab another cup of coffee because we know it's early in some parts of the world that are watching. After the break, we will have Sean from Google um, talk about free viewpoint video and some of the volumetric capture um, they are doing at Google. Then we will have Kalyan from Adobe talk about relighting approaches and Justus um, from the Technical University of Munich will talk about reenactment, more specifically about face reenactment and body reenactment. Finally, um, Ohad from Stanford will conclude with open challenges um, and a discussion of the social implications of such technology. We will end the session by a small Q&A slash panel discussion um, where we will answer the questions of the community and you will see all of us. Okay, so as you all know, I guess there are two alternatives of realistic image synthesis right now. There's a computer graphics side of doing it, like how it's done in movies, for example. But lately there's also the machine learning side, like in more particular um, generative machine learning, generative adversary networks, for example, that can generate really photorealistic imagery. And these two approaches are quite, um, well, it's like they have different um, advantages and disadvantages if you look at them. So for example, for um, photorealistic rendering in computer graphics, um, as we all know, this requires a lot of manual work. You have an artist um, who has at first to build high quality assets, like high quality geometry, scene materials. He has to set up the illumination correctly. And even if you get that right, you have really, really long global illumination render times to get to a photorealistic image. Um, but on the bright side, um, as we know, computer graphics is fully controllable. So we express these scenes we model in 3D using um, controllable scene parameters. For example, we, we specify um, where the camera is, where the light sources are in the scene, and we can easily modify find these parameters and tweak them if we want. So we can easily go in, they are human interpretable, so we can say like, oh, let's move the camera by a meter to the left, for example. And the same is true for motion, geometry, and appearance. It's all really human understandable and really nice. On the other side, if we look at generative machine learning techniques, um, it's kind of the opposite. So um, on, on the downside, like to train these approaches, we need a lot of training data, probably labeled training data. And these approaches don't provide fine-grained control about the semantic dimensions I've been talking about. So like if you want to change the illumination like of an image, it might not be clear with such a technique how to do it, except if we would have really labeled a big data set of labeled data, um, which is often not available. On the plus side, um, these approaches, if we have them and we have the data, we can train them fully automatically and learn all of that from the data in, instead of handcrafting it. And these approaches most of the time already come with interactive inf inference speeds. So you can do this rendering at interactive rates. So these approaches are most of the time really, really fast compared to global illumination rendering. So the idea um, of neural rendering is kind of to be somewhere in between these two approaches. Um, so have a fusion of classical computer graphics components with modern machine learning components. Um, and that's what we will call neural rendering during um, this tutorial session. So maybe one more example why it's hard to, to, to model things classically. 
Like if we look at our real world, our real world is really, really complex. So we might have objects that have transparency, like the smoke you can see here on the left, or there might be glossy surfaces. There might be surfaces with like thin structures like this teddy bear. And it's really hard to model each of these hairs individually. Um, also, if we look at the human, um, at ourselves, like our skin is, is highly complex. There's subsurface scattering, which is hard to model. We might be dressed in different ways. So there's a large variety of clothing that an artist would have to model. If we look at the human face or the human head, all these problems come together in one place. We have thin structures, our eyes are reflective and trans translucent. Um, so, and then we have the skin with the subsurface scattering. So it's really, really complex to, to model all of this in a, in a classical way, and it takes a lot of, lot of time. So this is when your rendering can come to the rescue by learning all of these effects from data, from captured image data. And actually all of these images I've been showing here are not photographs or um, rendered with classical um, computer graphics techniques, but these are all neural renderings, um, neural renderings of the approach of Lombardi et al., which we will talk about later on in this talk. Maybe let's dive a bit deeper into what neural rendering actually is. And we actually had quite, quite a debate writing this um, state of the art report, what the actual definition is, because it's something that is brand new and it's still exciting and people don't really agree on what it actually is yet. So we came up with the following definition. Um, so we define neural rendering as deep neural networks for image or video generation. Um, that enable explicit or implicit control of scene properties. Now let's look a bit closer at that. So there are three components. First is we want to generate images or videos. That, that's clear, I guess. We want to render, we want to generate pixel data. Um, and we want to do that with a network. Second, and that's a really big point for us, or was a big point for us, is the controllability here. Um, so we want these interpretable parameters we are used to from computer graphics, such that we can tweak them and influence how the images and videos we are generating look. And third, this goes hand in hand with the second point, we want these parameters to be something we are used to from computer graphics. So these parameters should be things like the camera position, um, the position of the light source, what's the pose of the human, what's the geometry, what's the appearance, what's the motion. What's the semantic structure of the scene? So we want to have these high level concepts to be able to influence um, the imagery we are synthesizing. Now let's have another look at this connection between computer graphics and machine learning. Um, so we are here at Eurographics. So I, I think you guys know in computer graphics, we start with a scene description. So we start with a description of our 3D scene around us. That means we start by specifying where the light sources are in, in a room, for example, what the geometry is of every part, um, what properties the materials have. Is this a diffuse surface? Is it a specular surface? And so on. Um, but we also specify motions, like is there something in the scene that's dynamic? So we specify how it moves, and we specify where the camera is. And then we, we take the scene description and we pass it through this magic function called computer graphics to generate us a high quality image. Machine learning on the other hand, normally starts the other way around in a way. Normally there, we start with a large corpus of real world images, like 2D images. And we are trying to discover something about our 3D world. We are trying to extract information from these images. So to, to abstract from the data. So in a, in a way, that's the other way. So we are going from 2D to 3D. Um, and as you can see here, that all forms kind of a loop. Um, so in, 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 in a way, like computer graphics is like going from 3D to 2D and the machine learning or computer vision can be sort of going from 2D to 3D. And the idea now of neural rendering is like to put all of this together to, to, use, to use these synergies um, by combining um, that. And what do I mean by that? I mean by that is um, that we could try to learn from 2D data. We could try to learn the scene description. So what the geometry is, what the materials are, 
for example, in a disentangled way. We could also try to learn the CG function, the rendering function. And that's what neural rendering is all about, like about this learning problem, like learning 3D from 2D and also deciding at which parts of this pipeline we are actually using machine learning techniques and at which part we might be actually using classical computer graphics techniques, which can be made differentiable such that we can still train these systems end to end. In the following, um, we will talk a bit about the fundamentals um, of neural rendering and the taxonomy we came up with, so like how we classified different approaches. And Ayush from MPI Informatics um, will now share his screen and continue with the talk. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the session. Um, hi everyone, I am Ayush Tiwari and uh, I'll be talking about some of the fundamentals behind neural rendering. So let me share the slides here. Okay, so um, as we know, computer graphics allows us to render high quality scenes like this uh, with complex light material interactions. We can synthesize dynamic scenes by animating the geometry or by changing the lights in the scene. Of course, uh, many different techniques are used in combination to render complex scenes like this, but let me talk about one core component, which is the rendering equation. The rendering equation allows us to compute the outgoing gradients from a point in the scene in an outgoing direction. In this case, let's consider it to be the uh, camera. The first term is just the light emitted by that point, which can directly be added up in the outgoing gradients. Then we can take the incoming light into account. So the outgoing gradients is determined by the BRDF function and the surface normal at that point. We need to do this computation for all incoming lights from all visible parts of the scene, which leads to this integral. Now, uh, what I explained can only take care of uh, direct illumination, but this equation can easily be extended to deal with global illumination. Methods like path tracing can then be used to solve this equation and render nice scenes like the one you saw before. We are looking at using neural networks for rendering, so let's take a brief look at them. For images, convolutional neural networks or CNNs are the common design choice. CNNs are classically used for classification or regression tasks. Um, let's assume that our task is to figure out if this given image is that of a cat. We take the image as input, pass it through a series of convolutional filters, nonlinearities, and subsampling layers in order to compute features at different scales. Finally, the network computes a single number, which is one if there's a cat in the image and zero otherwise. During training, the loss function penalizes incorrect predictions. These networks are commonly trained using backpropagation, where we apply chain rule to compute the gradients for the different filters at different uh, in the hierarchy. So CNNs are also used for synthesis tasks. Uh, generative adversarial networks are very commonly used for this task. Here we sample from a prior distribution, usually a Gaussian, uh, and we take that as our input. Um, this input is then passed through a CNN to synthesize the output image. The task of the network is to synthesize a realistic image for each sample from the prior. To train such methods, a discriminator is used, which tries to distinguish between synthesized and real images. The generator has the opposite objective. So the discriminator is happy if it can tell the synthesized images apart from the real images, and the generator is happy if the discriminator fails at its job. Uh, this minimax game is played uh, and the networks ideally converge to an equilibrium where the generator learns to mimic the manifold of real images, thus generating very realistic images at test time. This approach has had quite some success with methods like StyleGAN being able to synthesize very high resolution realistic images of portraits like these. So none of the people in these images are real and everything is synthesized. 
uh, while we can synthesize very high quality portrait images uh, like these, uh, GANs do not really allow for easy editing of the scene. To address that, conditional generative models have been proposed. Here, instead of sampling from a prior, a more meaningful input is given. For example, in pix to pix a sketch image is used as an input and the generator synthesize a photorealistic image of the object. To train this, um, they use a reconstruction loss, uh, which compares the output to the ground truth, as well as an adversarial loss, which ensures realism. Conditional models have also been extended to videos, where we can use methods like bit to bit to synthesize complex scenes like these based on segmentation masks as input. So based on what we saw now, um, here is a high level description of a neural rendering algorithm. We start with our training data, our observations, and the corresponding parameters of the rendering function. Once we have this, we learn a scene representation and rendering function using conditional generative models, which takes these rendering parameters as input. To train these methods, we use the observations again to design the loss functions similar to the ones we just saw. In our paper, we present a taxonomy of uh, neural rendering methods where we categorize them based on several axes, such as the kind of observations required for training, the parameters of the rendering function, which can be controlled at this time, and so on. Um, in this talk, I'll only briefly uh, cover one of these axes, uh, which is the computer graphics module. So there are some methods which directly take the rendering parameters as input in the network. So uh, neural scene representation and rendering, one of the first neural rendering approaches uses images and the corresponding viewpoints for training. It then trains a neural scene representation, which is then used in the rendering network. The rendering network gets the target viewpoint as input and the network learns to convert these real numbers into the corresponding image. So this approach um, is trained for a novel viewpoint synthesis. Some other methods such as deep video portraits first render a coarse and approximate scene based on the rendering parameters. Uh, this rendering is incomplete and far from photorealistic, but being an image, it makes it easier for a CNN to process uh, this kind of input. The neural renderer then learns to convert this into a photorealistic animation output. There are other methods which even more deeply integrate computer graphics modules. Neural volumes, instead of directly regressing an image, regress a volume instead. The image is then computed using volumetric ray tracing. This adds an inductive bias into the network and makes its job easier. If we want to change the viewpoint here, we do not need to provide it as an input to the network and hope that it can learn all possible combinations. Um, instead, we can just render the volume from the target viewpoint. So this is an example of how computer graphic techniques can be used to come up with interesting neural rendering approaches. Um, so as I said, we have several other access to classify uh, the different methods. So please look at uh, our paper for more details. Um, with that, let's take a deeper dive into neural rendering by looking at its different applications. And uh, we will start with Junyan. Um, thanks. Um, great. Uh, so thanks for uh, coming to my talk. Um, so I would like to talk about, uh, sorry, uh, maybe I need to, this one. I would like to talk about uh, semantic photosynthesis, one, one type of kind of neural rendering that allows a user uh, to create an image uh, in a semantically meaningful way. So let's look at what is the uh, what is the input and output. So uh, so given a semantic input map such as the image at the left, uh, here different pixels uh, represent different object concepts such as sky pixels, uh, mountain pixels, uh, sea pixels. Uh, we would like to synthesize uh, realistic output images such as the one at the right. So here is another example again. Uh, the input at the left, we have car pixel, road pixels, tree pixels, 
we would like to derive, derive a message uh, to generate an output image, uh, like a street view image conditional on this user input. Uh, so earlier, uh, inferential work used an exemplar-based approach. So given a user input, uh, we try to, uh, they try to retrieve different objects from the data sets, and you then use image blending techniques uh, to combine them together. Uh, there are two limitations uh, about the Burrow approach. Uh, first, these methods are often quite slow, uh, which prevents uh, real-time uh, user interactions. Uh, second, more importantly, uh, combining the two things together from different images will cause inconsistent lighting and uh, like uh, perspective camera po different poses, uh, which, which makes things uh, look unrealistic. So more recently, people start using kind of learning-based approach uh, to address the above issues. Uh, one, one recent example is to pix to pix uh, So in pix to pix we use the framework of generative adversary networks, where a generator uh, tries to map an input to the output, and the discriminator uh, tries to decide if the output is real or fake. Also, there's only one issue here is so this this output looks realistic, uh, but so does this uh, so does this output image. But this image also looks real, um, but it has uh, nothing to do with the input uh, semantic in label map. Uh, to address this mismatch, we feed both the input and and output uh, to the discriminator. So this encourages the discriminator to decide uh, whether output or whether whether input output pair is real or fake. Uh, by doing this, we can pro produce an output uh, that corresponds to, to the input semantic label map. This allows us to generate an image given, given, a, given a semantic input. Um, but here, here is a, some example is here is a more like high resolution input layout uh, with different kind of semantic labels. Uh, we would like to create also generate a high risk output image out of it. So unfortunately, uh, pix to pix does not work so well uh, due to the high dimensional nature of the optimization problems in the in the game training. Uh, to address this challenge, uh, so we propose uh, pix to pix HD uh, with with collaborators from Nvidia. Uh, so this is where a very simple strategy inspired by the image pyramid uh, and a classic classic idea in computer graphics and computer vision. So we first generate a low res output and we further up sample and refine the low res output with a stage two network. So we decompose the hard problem into two easier ones. So we know how to generate a low res output. We also know refining results is always easier than generating image from scratch. Uh, so given the above cost to fund procedure, it can produce a nearly a uh, photorealistic output at 2000 by 1000 resolution uh, at real time. So here is a demo uh, where a user can, can paint uh, some strokes on the background to add more trees. Um, however, generating a natural photo in the wild is still very difficult. So here we apply pix to phd uh, on more challenging data sets like, like, like Coco. Uh, so even if it works on street street view like restricted restrict domains like cityscapes, it doesn't work beyond like like fifty or different labels. Uh, and, and more interestingly, if if the if the label was uniform, the output was always the same, no matter which label we used. And so to address this problem, uh, we will look we'll look uh, at the network in, in more detail. So a standard network uh, have the uh, several of convolutional layers followed by the normalization layers. Um, so these normalization layers ha have some nice property, like for example, it makes make smooth gradient flow and in invariance the input scaling. But we realize that applying it on the semantic layout results will result in too much invariance. Sometimes we'll lose the information uh, from the semantic uh, label uh, map. Uh, so uh, as an example, Suppose the input label map it was 100% grass, the convolutional layer will produce uniform uniform activations. Will be will, then the output will become all zero after we normalize it. So to preserve this semantic information, uh, we propose to uh, input the semantic uh, map after every normalization layer. So we use the semantic label map to modulate the features from the previous layer, and this allows us to generate different. 
uh, different kind of textures given the given the flat input. Uh, to, so to look at more in more details, uh, we pass the semantic label map through uh, convolutional layers and produce some feature tensors. And after and we fuse this information with the with the batch, no, batch normalized features from the previous layers. And we do element-wise multiplication and addition using the feature tensors. Uh, you can we can view it as a as a as a new way of doing conditional batch norm, well, which will make the a fine transformation part on uh, spatially variant conditioned on the semantic lay, layout. So uh, now our, architect, our architecture can can start from a random noise and take the semantic label on uh, at every 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 layer of our sampling blocks. And uh, moreover, this architecture allows us to separate the semantics. Uh, to disentangle semantics and style control. For example, here we can we can we can modify the semantic layout uh, and feed it in as a modulation. And we can also just sample different kind of like latent code, style code, and produce different style code given the same semantic layout. So here we sh uh, show a demo. We had a demo in the SQL of real time live last year. Uh, an artist. Uh, um, it's able to create an image um, very quickly within one or two minutes. Um, and you can add some mountains, you can add some um, beach or sand. And you can also uh, have very fun control. You can add a little bit logs uh, on, on the sand. And I think the most interesting part for me is actually that the mountain in, 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 at a distance looks a little bit hazy. Uh, and which is quite adaptive given the distance and the context, and you can change different styles. And here, here it was has been used by uh, concept designers and illustrators at major film studios. Again, here's the uh, here's the input and here the, uh, the spade output, and the artist can add more objects either from 3D rendering or from his own or her own creations and add more layers. Uh, on top of the, the, the output, um, but I think I think it's very interesting to combine this semantic kind of control with more like kind of three D graphics control. Here, in a more recent work, we decompose an image into semantics, but also into like three D layers, uh, like depths and posts, and and then later we can we can we can modify we can we can control the position of each object, and also control the semantics of each object. And then generate a new image. Uh, here, an example, is given an uh, original image, uh, we can we can move the car um, closer to the camera. So this was enabled by this uh, inverse inverse graphics rendering. And but we can also change the the color of the car. We can change the color of the of the of the uh, background. But we can also change the semantics of the scene. We can remove the car completely. So I, I think moving forward uh, in the future, it will be very nice to to combine the semantic control with the the three D graphics control. I think multiple speak speakers will discuss in, in a minute. So in summary, uh, the semantic photosynthesis allows us to convert a user input, simple user input, to a realistic output, and has been used by uh, many visual artists. And uh, moving forward, uh, the challenge is how can we con combine Different controls like 3D controls, like a texture of each object and material and lighting in, a, in the same framework. And how can we generate high resolution output on actually on a mobile device like an iPad or like an iPhone? Uh, which, so, this kind of model I still have to learn on uh, very high end GPUs. And how can we enable video control because we don't want to author a semantic input label map for every single video frame, so which is not ideal. How can we? Have even even easier control for the videos, and by that, thank my collaborators. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Thanks a lot. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, my name is Vincent, and I'm going to talk about uh, novel use synthesis uh, for objects and scenes. Uh, here we go. There we go. Uh, let me first uh, define the problem. So um, novel view synthesis deals with the problem given a set of observations of a 3D scene, where every observation is an image plus the intrinsic and extrinsic camera parameters, 
we want to learn a model that allows us to render novel perspectives of the underlying 3D scene, like you can see in this example here. Um, one key takeaway that I want you uh, to have from today is the general framework in which all of these models operate. Um, so uh, the framework will start with a set of observations here on the left-hand side. And there will always be some notion of a reconstruction algorithm. And the reconstruction algorithm is an algorithm that takes in um, these observations and maps them to some representation of the underlying 3D scene. And that's going to be our scene representation. And now, um, because we want to do novel view synthesis, we will require some form of rendering algorithm. And because we're in machine learning, it has to be a differentiable rendering algorithm. So we're going to build this differentiable rendering algorithm. And that's going to take as input um, the scene representation and a camera perspective, and then allow us to render the scene from that camera perspective. And now finally, this allows us to close the loop and train this algorithm end to end by just rendering the same observations that we have in the training data set and enforcing just a 2D re-rendering loss on these uh, observations. So now one of the key questions in this line of research is how do we do few shot reconstruction? And what that means is, what if we only have a single observation? Or what if we only have very few observations? And, and as a result, the underlying 3D scene is under constrained given these observations. And for that, we have to be a little bit smarter with the reconstruction algorithm. Um, and the reconstruction algorithm in these cases will have to be learned. And it's going to learn a prior over the set of all possible scene representations. And that then will allow us to um, reconstruct scenes even if we only have very few observations of the scene. Um, arguably, one of the simplest models that falls into this general framework is uh, a variation of a convolutional autoencoder. So um, in this case, the convolutional encoder, that's the reconstruction algorithm. So that will take in an observation and encode it into a latent code. And the latent code, that's our scene representation. And then we can concatenate this latent code with a camera pose and decode the resulting representation into an image with a convolutional decoder. And so the convolutional decoder, that can be thought of as our differentiable rendering algorithm. And then you can train this thing end to end on a data set of observations. So now uh, one problem if you try to do this, even for the simpler data sets like ShapeNet here, um, this convolutional autoencoder model was trained on two and a half thousand cars with 50 observations per car. And as you can see, it fails to reconstruct the true underlying 3D shape of these cars. And this is another key takeaway here. Um, one of the key insights from this line of uh, work in recent years has been that we need to e equip these models with some notion of 3D structure in order for this to work out in the end. And if you uh, look at all of these different representations and the rendering algorithms on which we'll briefly touch in a moment, you'll find that both the scene representations and the rendering algorithms are often adapted or at least inspired by classic algorithms from computer, computer graphics. And this is a trend that will um, probably continue a little bit in the future as well. So now I'm briefly going to touch on um, each of these different um, representations and rendering algorithms that have been described over the past uh, few years. And then I'm going to spend some extra time on implicit representations. And I'm briefly going to talk about the pros and cons. So this has to be very high level, unfortunately, because we have uh, very limited time. So first, let's take a look at multiplane images. So what is a multiplane image? That key idea is to have to represent our 3D scene as a set of images that are placed at different depth planes. And then the, the rendering algorithm will be an alpha compositing algorithm, which composites um, the, the pixels along array in some smart way that allows us to render novel views. So this uh, kind of approach has led to extremely high quality results. Um, and uh, you can even render videos. So it's very high quality. It allows you to generalize. So it has even from few observations, you can reconstruct these multiplane images. And it's very fast at, at test time. However, this only allows you to do two and a half D novel view synthesis. You can't ever look at the backside of an object. You can only um, basically have some baseline um, from which you can render novel views. And these multiple images are very big. So then um, there's voxel grid based representations. And so here the scene representation is a voxel grid, either a voxel grid of features, learned features, or maybe um, RGB color. And in these cases, the rendering algorithms are uh, ray based. So either they uh, somehow 
accumulate, you shoot a ray into the voxel grid and you accumulate all the features along the ray in, in some form. And so these algorithms allow you to do two 3D null view synthesis. So you can uh, you know, look at the back side of an object, for instance. And they also enable pretty high quality. However, um, it turns out that it's rather hard to define reconstruction priors on these voxel grid representations, um, which means in practice that um, you always need quite a few uh, observations to make these voxel grids work. And the memory scales cubically with the spatial resolution we want to achieve. So for high spatial resolutions, people require a lot of memory. Um, then there's image-based representations. And image-based representations um, are really strongly inspired by classic image-based rendering from computer, computer graphics. And uh, here, the representation is a mesh reconstructed, uh, so like just uh, recon uh, some representation of scene geometry. And pixels are warped into novel, uh, novel views given this geometry. And so these, um, these approaches can also achieve quite high qualities, but they do require um, a good geometry reconstruction to start out with. So geometry reconstruction isn't performed by the machine learning algorithm. Um, and they don't allow for some compact representation. Um, point clouds uh, are very similar in this regard. Um, they can also enable high quality true 3D novel view synthesis but they also require a good structure for motion or geometry construction to start out with. So now um, the a very, very recent line of work um, is implicit scene representations. And I'm going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. Um, so an example of this is our own work called scene representation networks for at NeurIPS in 2019. And the key idea of implicit scene representations is to represent a scene um, as a function. And usually that function maps um, world coordinates, uh, like 3D coordinates, to some representation of whatever is at these world coordinates. And so that was the key idea of scene representation networks as well. So they map, it's a fully connected neural network, maps a 3D coordinate to a feature vector of whatever is at that 3D coordinate. The rendering algorithm was inspired by classical shear tracing and computer graphics. But it's basically, again, a ray-based ray rendering algorithm where you shoot a ray and you look for the intersection with scene geometry and then you render whatever is there. And another key contribution here was uh, a prior-based reconstruction algorithm. In this case, it was a hypernetwork-based approach that learns distributions over the weights of these scene representations. And what this allows you to do now is to go from a single image of a car, uh, um, like this single image here, to a full 3D reconstruction of the car. So only from a single image, you can reconstruct a full 3D model that allows you to do perfectly multi-view consistent novel view synthesis. However, as you notice, this is a rather simple example. So now recently this has been extended by uh, Milton Hall et al. And this is uh, called neural radiance fields. It's very cool work. And here the scene representation again is a fully connected neural network. This time it gets its input also the view direction. The rendering algorithm this time is slightly different. It's a volumetric rendering algorithm. But again, it's, it's array-based. There is a notion of uh, accumulating information at long array. And, and this algorithm doesn't generalize. But um, what it does allow you to do is basically photorealistic true 3D knob view synthesis. Um, so this is really, really cool. And so uh, that's the summary of implicit representations. So they are true 3D. They do allow you, in principle, photorealistic quality. Um, and there is a notion that they may generalize. Um, however, the downside of all of these algorithms is, as of now, they're extremely expensive to render and to train. And this gets me to the summary of this uh, section on novel view synthesis, um, which are open challenges. And to me, the most important and interesting open challenge is this question of generalization versus photorealism. Right now, we can do this few-shot 3D reconstruction only for very, very simple scenes. Um, like these car scenes, for instance, or very simple rooms, synthetic scenes. Um, whenever you want to get high quality photorealism, we always require dense sampling, um, lots of images of the underlying scene. And we can't have both in the moment. We can either, either have generalization or photorealism, can't have both. Um, another question is editability. If you have a mesh as a scene representation, you can edit it by hand. Um, if, you, if your scene is represented by a neural, ne neural network, that's a little bit harder. And finally, dynamics. Um, how can we incorporate a time component into these models? And um, this is uh, the summary of um, novel use synthesis. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Vincent. Now I'm going to start sharing my slides, but before starting to talk about uh, your ending for performance capture, we're actually going to take a five minute break. I'm sure many of us can use our coffee. So we will be back shortly.
we should probably be back live. Okay, I see the YouTube stream started. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Fonello from Google and in the next seven minutes I'm going to tell you everything about new rendering for performance capture. For those of you that are not actually familiar with the problem of performance capture, this problem is also known as volumetric videos, volumetric capture, free viewpoint videos. And the goal is usually to have a subject acquired from multiple viewpoints. And what you want to do is to reconstruct the actual geometry of this performer, as well as the reflectance properties such as albedo, surface normals, and gloss maps. So you can take this 3D model and place them in real scenes, as shown here, like if they were really composited there. Now, you could see that the actual reconstructions look appealing and compelling. However, for an expert eye, you will notice that they are not really photorealistic yet. And there are some imperfections, especially when the geometry is wrong or view-dependent effects are not uh, captured uh, correctly. Now, why is performance capture important? If you work in the field, you obviously know that uh, you can generate uh, a lot of 3D content for mixed reality applications such as virtual and augmented reality. But also, if you can do real-time performance capture, you can imagine a system that can do real-time telepresence, so you can scan in real-time one of these subjects, teleport them to another place, and then you can have two people interacting like if they are co-located in the same space. And that's pretty cool. It's some work we showed back uh, at Microsoft in 2016 with the holoportation work, and there are more recent advances with neural rendering that enable actually higher quality results there. There is another application of performance capture that perhaps is less obvious, which is actually using as a training data for machine learning tasks. Indeed, if you're a machine learning person, you probably spend 80% of your time trying to actually clean your data and make sure that the ground truth is really ground truth, right? And what I mean for machine learning task, I mean that you can take these reconstructions and generate the ground truth for pose estimation. You can imagine all these multi-view cameras will give you pretty accurate hand tracking, face tracking, pose detection, triangulated in 3D, temporally consistent, or you can have ground truth for depth estimation from single image, segmentation and masking, relighting and compositing. So there are a lot of cool perception tasks that can be solved thanks to this sort of system. Now, if you look at all these images, they have something in common. They're all photorealistic images, and that's what you probably do if you want to solve the perception tasks in the wild, right? So why is it hard to capture or render photorealistic humans? Let's try to take a look at the state of art volumetric capture pipeline. This is the reliable pipeline we presented at the Sigraph Asia last year, but many of these pipelines share a lot of these similarities here. So you usually start from images, perhaps with different illumination conditions in case uh, you want to also recover reflectance information. From images, you usually build a mesh model and a parameterization of this mesh. Then you have a texture space where you can aim for some RGB values, and then perhaps you can assume a certain BRDF model that allows you to recover reflectance properties such as albedo, gloss map, and normal map. And finally, you want to take these models and you want to render them somewhere, and there is a rendering phase. Now, if we take a deep look at this pipeline, there are some issues. No matter how accurate re your reconstruction will be, a mesh model is usu usually limited in its expressiveness. So even if uh, it's pretty detailed, it's very hard to capture fine-grained details such as hair strands on transparent objects or translucent objects. And assuming that the mesh model is sufficient for your task, you usually have some imperfections in geometry and calibration that uh, lead to very blurry texture maps that are not as sharp as the input images. Then you usually make some assumption on the BRDF model. For instance, uh, in the Relatables pipeline, we assume a cosine lob model. And finally, the rendering phase itself, you guys probably know this better than I do, it's uh, a beast. It's very challenging, as we saw also previously in this tutorial. Indeed, if we even pretend for a second that we have a perfect geometry and a perfect reflectance model, and all we have to do is to solve the rendering equation, when you actually start to add high order light transport effects, such as the global illumination, you want to model subsurface scattering, intra reflection, and so on, you see that the geometry and the BRDS actually plays a really a small component in the rendering equation. And that's where neural rendering actually comes into the rescue because you can actually learn all these high order light transport effects directly from the data. Now, where do you apply neural rendering in such a pipeline, right? 
We've seen a pretty good overview from Vincent of the various techniques. Here, I want to briefly mention two different approaches. One approach is usually to start from a base geometry, from a certain mesh, on a certain parameterization of your 3D space, and then applying your render on top. The other approach consists instead of learning in the volumes and the 3D representation directly from the images. There isn't the right transfer here. There are pro and cons for each of these methods. Vincent mentioned quite a few of them. In this particular talk, I want to briefly go a little bit deeper to these kind of approaches that they start from a base mesh. And the reason is because we can cast them very nicely in this pipeline that I showed you before. So if you take a look at this pipeline, where do you apply your rendering? Well, you can actually apply it pretty much everywhere you want. For instance, in the looking good work, uh, by Bart and Burrell et al. What we did here was to apply neural rendering at the very last stage. So imagine you have a CG asset, you can render the asset with whatever rendering engine you prefer, and then on top of it, you have a neural re-rendering phase that takes this rendered image and tries to recover the final photo register. So this is more than image-to-image -image translation task rather than a rendering phase itself. Another way to do this, uh, this work by Eustus and the others who will see more details later in this tutorial. I like it because we can cast again in this pipeline I just showed you. So instead of actually having texture space where you store an RGB value for each pixel, you can actually learn a representation per pixel in UV space. So when you perform the rendering phase, rather than uh, resampling RGB, RGB values, you're going to resample this uh, learned representation. And then you have a decoder, which is a neural rendering that actually will give you the final results as we showed here. Okay, I talked about uh, neural rendering, but does it actually work? Well, yeah, if this video was playing smoother, you would actually notice that uh, the reconstruction on the left, they look nice. However, there's still lack of photorealism. Indeed, it doesn't really capture view dependent effects especially in when you have strong directional lighting conditions such as the ones shown here. And you can see that the one on the right, when you are rendering, actually recovers all nice, nicely uh, view-dependent effects and specularity. So are we done with neural rendering for performance capture? Actually, no. There is still a lot that needs to be done. The summary here is that many of these methods actually lack of generalization. They cannot handle moving performers, and usually they're not even reliable. But the most important thing is that everything I showed you here still requires this full capture system with multiple cameras capturing, capturing the user. And the dream here is to actually scale performance capture to just a single RGB camera. That's all for performance capture. Now we're going to have Kalyan talking specifically about relighting. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So let me just share my screen. And I think. Yep. All right. Okay. So you, you should be able to see my screen right now. Um, and uh, so I want to uh, thank you, Sean, again, and uh, welcome everyone to this section of this. Uh, um, state-of-the-art report on neural rendering, where we'll be talking about uh, neural rendering methods for relighting. Uh, my name is Kalyan Sunkavalli, and I'm a senior research scientist at Adobe Research. Um, so Sean already, oh, sorry, Sean already talked about relighting in the context of uh, human performance capture. But just to recap, essentially the problem of relighting is to take a set of input images under certain lighting conditions, and then be able to produce a new image of the same object or the scene re-rendered under novel lighting. Now, again, as Sean described, like a kind of classical way method to achieve relighting is to take captured input images of a scene and then reconstruct that scene's geometry and reflectance. And once you have these geometry and reflectance, you can pass them to a renderer along with your specifications of the novel lighting to then re-render that object under uh, novel lighting conditions. Now, the problem, of course, is that uh, reconstructing scene geometry and reflectance, these are very hard problems, and even state-of-the-art methods make errors in these estimates, and then these uh, errors kind of propagate through the renderer and result in artifacts in the final related images. So the promise of neural rendering in this context is that we can build methods where you can use deep networks 
that work with inaccurate geometry and reflectance and still produce photorealistic results. And uh, and and Sean already showed you a few examples of the kind of uh, things you can do with these methods. But I want to sh wanted to show you another method in this space in the context of free lighting, uh, which is the work of Philip et al., who take multiple images of an outdoor scene, uh, shot from multiple viewpoints, and from that can re-render that scene both under a novel view and under novel outdoor lighting conditions. And they kind of fall in this reconstruction-based uh, pipeline where uh, the key insight of this work is that you can basically take these multiple in in input images and reconstruct the geometry of the scene. Now, this reconstruction is not going to be accurate, but it is reasonable as the 3D proxy to actually guide a relighting network. And the way they do this is that they use the 3D proxy and some novel lighting specifications to render geometry and lighting buffers, which then, along with the input image that you want to relight, are passed to a neural network, which actually does the final relighting. And so by in introducing this neural network, they're able to produce the kind of results that I showed you earlier. Um, so this is, of course, uh, like I said, this classical uh, approach, which explicitly uses reconstructed geometry in the heavens. But there is another approach to relighting in the kind of graphics community, which is that instead of uh, re explicitly reconstructing geometry reflectance, you kind of treat the captured images as just samples of the light transport function of the scene. And then if the viewpoint is fixed, then this basically reduces to the image-based relighting problem where you take these captured images and then uh, combine them in different ways to produce the relit images. And Image-based relighting methods can produce really compelling results. The problem, though, is that they often require very dense um, image capture. You need hundreds of images of that scene or object under like a very dense sampling of the possible lighting conditions. So this is, of course, time-consuming and expensive. And in this context, the promise of neural rendering methods is that you can potentially achieve that same visual quality, but while capturing uh, fewer images, significantly less than 100 images, maybe at the order of like one, two, or six images. images. And in this context, I want to talk about some work we did, uh, which was at SIGGRAF 2018, where we basically showed that you can capture five images of like an object or a scene under some predefined lighting conditions, under predefined directional lights, and then use um, a deep network to predict the appearance of the scene under an arbitrary directional light. And then now that you can do this rendering under arbitrary directional light, you can then actually use that to then render the scene under arbitrary environment illumination. And the way this method works is that, like I said, we have five images of uh, this scene under predefined lighting conditions. And here I'm showing those lighting conditions with these gray dots that are kind of on the circle that represents the upper hemisphere of uh, lighting directions. And at each of these dots, we've captured an input image. And then we can step back these input images along with the lighting directions and pass this to uh, kind of a, a deep convolutional encoder. And we also take the new lighting direction that we want to kind of simulate and encode that and stack that with this bottleneck feature and then use a decoder to uh, synthesize the final relit input. And as this novel viewpoint moves around on this hemisphere, our network then synthesizes new images that correspond to that novel lighting condition. And now we call this network ReLightNet. I mean, it's like a fairly obvious name. But one thing we found is that actually the quality of the relighting we get from this network actually depends also on the input images, the input lighting directions that we picked. So to handle this, we also have this component where we actually uh, take a dense set of lighting samples and then have a learnable kind of sample selection layer, which uh, kind of predicts what are the uh, optimal sparse samples for best uh, relighting quality. And we kind of train this whole uh, both sample net and relighting net end to end to kind of minimize the errors from relighting. And, and we train this on purely synthetic data, but actually turns out it generalizes quite well to real data. Here I'm showing you two captures uh, from a, a kind of a sparse light stage uh, data set. And you can see these are images relight under environment illumination. And you can see we're able to capture kind of these specular highlights on this helmet, the soft shadows on the, 
on the night and like fairly complex light transport events. And we actually took this work and extended it um, to actually do both novel view synthesis and relighting where you can take again a sparse set of images and then do view synthesis to produce images of this metal bunny with all these specular highlights that move under novel viewpoints. And then we can freeze a particular viewpoint and then generate images of that viewpoint under arbitrary um, kind of environment illumination. So uh, now there I showed you that, you know, for some arbitrary objects, you can take five images and reproduce appearance under uh, novel lighting, but Meka et al actually in the specific context of humans showed that you don't even, you need actually only two images. So you can take two images that are captured under uh, specific lighting conditions called color gradient lighting. And then again, use a deep network to then predict the appearance of this person under uh, kind of every possible directional light. So essentially the full 2D reflectance field of this person. And if you can do that, then you can produce um, re relayed facial performances like this, uh, where the fact that you're capturing only two images means that you can actually capture those two images quickly and handle dynamic sequence like this. And, and kind of going along with this theme that, again, in the context of human People have shown that now you can actually even work with a single input image that's captured in completely unknown, uncalibrated illumination, and then have kind of free lighting networks that then re-render this person under novel lighting. Now you can see that the visual quality is not quite the same as the methods before, but remember that this is a big jump from multiple images captured in very calibrated conditions to kind of a single image in the wild uh, captured in illumination that we have no idea of. So, um, with that, I'll kind of wrap up this section. We talked about a bunch of recent neural rendering based methods for relighting. And I want to end with a few thoughts on kind of challenges and opportunities in the space. So first of all, uh, we stepped through methods that went from capturing like more calibrated input to kind of input in the wild. Uh, but in general, this kind of ease of acquisition question is important in relighting, especially because uh, relighting often requires understanding or reasoning about the scene's appearance and material properties. And this is challenging in the wild in like kind of arbitrary natural illumination. But there is some promising recent work which actually uh, kind of reconstructs material properties from images like this. So maybe there are some interesting applications of that in the neural rendering space. The other challenge is that many of these methods kind of that I presented make kind of assumptions about the lighting that may not be true in the real world. In the real world, illumination tends to be localized. It can vary spatially, it can be dynamic and handling that is challenging. Uh, but again, in this space also, there are some um, in the wild inverse rendering methods that could potentially be useful for neural rendering approaches. And the final thing I wanna talk about is that um, most of the work I talked about kind of does not explicitly consider geometry uh, while either does not consider geometry while doing the relighting, or if it does, it kind of pre-computes the geometry and then just does relighting on that pre-computed geometry. But Vincent presented a whole bunch of really exciting work in view synthesis, which builds scene representations and differentiable renderers to kind of do end-to-end -end learning of uh, kind of uh, for view synthesis. Now, it might be interesting to see how these approaches actually extend to relighting to kind of do end-to-end -end, uh, kind of scene inference and uh, neural rendering. So with that, I'll now hand it over to Eustace, who will talk about um, uh, facial and human reenactment. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Let me share the screen. So my name is Jesus Thies and today I will talk about um, facial reenactment and also body reenactment. Let me first start with uh, human face, uh, facial uh, reenactment. And probably you know, like the classical approach that I introduced like three years ago, it's called face-to-face. -face. It's based on classical computer graphics uh, um, approaches and we uh, basically uh, reconstruct a statistical face model from an RGB camera. We do this for an input scene and for um, like a source and a target scene. And we transfer the expressions from one actor to another actor. And then we use classical computer graphics approaches with texturing to get this final image here. But the problem with this approach is that you need a lot of manual 
like work in this process and there are a lot of handcrafted heuristics. Especially when you have a look at the mouth region. So in this approach, we basically uh, built up a huge data set of mouth interiors and how the mouth should look like if a specific expression is applied. And between these uh, different expressions from frame to frame, we basically have to blend between these uh, frames from the data set. And this is a lot of like handcrafted heuristics that ha have to be applied here. And um, yeah, this also lowers the quality of the uh, final um, outputs. In contrast to that, we uh, have seen several neural rendering approaches that um, improve the results. Here is an example of um, Kim et al. It's called Deep Video Portraits. And the idea is that you go from the source sequence to synthetic renderings of a statistical phase model. So you still have to uh, like reconstruct all the motions of the source actor and you transfer it to a um, like virtual avatar of the target person. Here, you then have like these synthetic renderings and the network comes into play when you go from these synthetic renderings to the final output. And when you compare like these methods, like the classical computer graphics approach here on the right with these uh, new learned methods, you can see that you are able to uh, like reproduce much more details of the scene. And it's also much easier in the learning process. So you don't have um, these handcrafted heuristics and you also can like reproduce uh, things that you don't have like in your statistical model, like uh, the shadows here on the uh, bookshelf here are reproduced by this neural rendering approach of reenactment of this deep video portrait method. And um, when you, when we go back to uh, like this overview of the method. So when we uh, like go from the synthetic images here to the final output, it's based on the unit network. And uh, one input of this method is like this correspondence map. And when we look at this correspondence map from like computer graphics perspective, it's basically um, a texture coordinate. And in classical computer graphics, you can use like this correspondence map to look up a texture value from a texture to then render out um, the final image. The idea of deferred neural rendering is now to learn this texture. And instead of storing RGB values in the texture, you learn high dimensional features in this texture. Then you can basically sample from this texture and you get like these high dimensional features in image space. But obviously, like these um, features in image space are not our result. So we have to interpret um, these features. And that's um, where the neural network comes into play. So we have a neural renderer here in the end, which is basically also a unit that interprets these sampled uh, features to get the final output image. And the cool thing is that we can train this network here end to end so the neural renderer here and the texture um, when we have like um, the training data like uv maps here and the output image and the uv maps and the output image here like uh, the crown truth image we get from um, video footage that you, can, that you can download from the internet so you basically have to reconstruct the face again from the um, video here and you can basically render for this phase, you can render these UV maps. And in the training process, you optimize for the textures and the renderer such that you reproduce um, this uh, YouTube video. When you do this, you basically have a renderer now that can transfer or transform UV maps here to original looking images, so real looking images. And of course, now you can also like modify um, this UV map because you have an underlying 3D model. You can basically edit the expressions. And this is well, an example. Bush 41, Clinton, Bush 43, or Obama. These expressions. And why? I, I would really say Clinton, probably. I would have to say Clinton. And why? 
there was a little spirit. He, frankly, he would have been had he. So you can basically see in this video how we uh, track the expressions of Trump here. We uh, render the corresponding UV maps of um, the virtual Obama, and then we use this as input to our uh, network to render this output image. In recent work, we extended this to only work on audio. So here the idea is that you have audio-driven facial reenactment. So the idea is that you have an audio stream and this audio stream is translated to person-specific expressions that allow you to render a dense um, model. And then you have like, again, a neural renderer that transfer, uh, transforms these dense maps to the final output image. And in the following, I will show a result for this here. So here on the left, um, you have like uh, the audio input of Benjo and uh, it's transferred to Obama. Science makes progress by steps. Most of those steps are small, some are slightly bigger. Uh, seen from the outside, sometimes people have the impression that, oh, there's this big breakthrough, breakthrough, and journalists like to talk about breakthrough, 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 breakthrough. But actually, science is very, very progressive because we gradually understand better the world. So when you look at all these methods that I showed you here, um, they all are based on a dense face model. So you have an underlying statistical model that looks like this, and you have a dense surface. In contrast to that, there are also approaches that are relying on sparse input features, like these landmarks of a face. For example, like this few shot adversarial learning uh, from Sakharov et al. Or also like this um, approach here, where you go from audio input to um, these landmarks, and then you transfer these, transform these landmarks to an uh, output image. When we now have a look at the body reenactment, we can have um, similar results there. So the idea here is to transfer the motions of this person here on the left to um, this person here on the right. So in this case, it's self-reenactment, but you can see how um, the right video follows the motions of the left video. Similar to the face example, you have methods that rely on dense input data and methods that rely on sparse data. So the method that we saw is a dense method. It basically relies on synthetic renderings of the human, and these synthetic renderings are then transformed to the final output image. On the sparse side, you have methods, for example, like Everybody Dance Now, where you basically have a network that, that transforms these um, like stick figures to final output images. There are also more hybrid approaches like textured neural avatars. So here the idea is that um, you basically transform these sparse inputs to dense UV maps. So you have the skeleton input here and you have a network that transforms this skeleton input to dense uh, UV maps in the image space. And then you can basically sample from a standard RGB texture. And this way, they basically get more temporal coherent results. So let me summarize um, the reenactment part. And we will have a look at the open challenges. So as uh, Sean, already, Sean already mentioned, um, we rely on good data. So if you have a motion capturing system that is not able to uh, like track a person uh, temporarily coherent, you get like bad training data. And um, as a result, your results of the neural rendering method will also be temporarily unstable and you will get flickering artifacts. Also interesting to um, have a look at is like person-specific motions and expressions. So especially for the face, you want to uh, reproduce the expressions of a specific person. And you don't want to uh, like transfer the expressions from um, 
person A to per, uh, person B uh, without any adaption to uh, like the uh, physical um, settings of person B. And um, yeah, so when you go want to go to high quality, like when you want to increase the image quality for these like reenactment tasks, you always have to consider that you then need better motion capturing data because then uh, the differences of your, um, like if you uh, make an error in your tracking on high quality image data, you have much uh, larger variety or like reprojection errors in the image space. With that, I want to hand over to Ohad, who will like conclude uh, the STAR report. And he will also talk about the open challenges in general and also like the ethical uh, implications. Okay, hey, perfect. Thank you for that. Let me just share my screen. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ohad Fried. I'm currently a postdoc at Stanford University. Uh, soon, an assistant professor at the Interdisciplinary Center in Arcelia. So, shameless plug, I'm looking for students. Uh, please reach out if you're interested. Uh, first off, I would really like to thank all the wonderful co authors, some of which you've already met today, but there are many others that you haven't. Really, the state of the art report uh, was a true collaboration between great researchers from multiple institutions, which, which I'm proud to call my collaborators. Um, at this point, I hope most of you are convinced that neural rendering has already impacted many important research directions in computer vision and computer graphics. But of course, we're only at the beginning of the journey. Right? Neural rendering is still relatively new. There are many open challenges and existing opportunities for future research. Uh, we discussed several open challenges in the paper. Today, I would like to emphasize two of them, generalization, or rather the lack of generalization, and editability. How can we make neural rendering useful for users interacting with the system? So let's go over these uh, one by one. Okay, so what do I mean when I say generalization? Here's a system that uses neural rendering to convert text transcript into a video of a person saying the transcript. You type in the text and this is what you get. Okay. The market closed today with Apple's stock price at $182.25 per share. Cool. Now, while the results are, are quite impressive, it is important to understand that this system is extremely specific in its training and applicability. Uh, the neural renderer's task in this case is to convert frames that include CG renderings and missing parts into photorealistic frames. Uh, the network is trained on this specific person with these specific clothes, hairstyle, backdrop, we completely break for a different person. Uh, so one immediate question is why, right? What's the advantage in being this specific? And the short answer is that result quality is higher since we really, we ask the network to learn a much more constrained distribution. Uh, however, there's also a huge disadvantage. For each new video, we need to retrain a neural network, which requires data, costs time, storage. Uh, and that's what I mean when I say generalization, right? The ability to work on varied inputs. Uh, I kind of picked on one example, but when examining the state of the art, we actually see that specifically for reenactment tasks, most methods do not have this generality property. Right here, I'm showing you part of a table we have in the star report that summarizes the different properties of the methods we surveyed. Uh, as you can see, the generality column is very much in the red for uh, reenactment methods. Not, uh, about generalization, but uh, generalization over what? As always, it really depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Going back to the example we've already seen, we would really like it and all applications that involve humans to work not just for a specific person, but for all people. Uh, and of course, it's important to remember that people are extremely diverse in properties such as age, gender, physicality, and they can also appear in strikingly different poses, clothes, makeup, etc. Uh, but of course, people are not the only object class in the universe. We have 
various algorithms that are uh, pretty robust when they see cats and shells, just because we have large data sets of cats and shells. Uh, but what we really want is algorithms that can handle arbitrary objects, even if we don't have lots of data for such objects, and perhaps also handle objects that we never saw before. Now, going beyond individual objects, some neural rendering tests can benefit from generalization over different environments and for making them applicable to large scenes with many objects and object types. Uh, essentially, what we want is neural rendering algorithms that can be trained once and then used everywhere. Uh, now, one might be tempted to think that given enough data, generalization will spontaneously emerge. However, as you heard today, uh, we are starting to see evidence to the contrary. Right? The network architecture might not be able to generalize, not due to the lack of data, but due to the architecture itself. Thus, we really believe that there are many interesting opportunities in bringing in classical computer graphics knowledge into the design of these architectures to make them more general, to allow both interpolation and extrapolation to unseen data. Uh, the second open challenge I want to talk about today is editability. Traditional computer graphic systems are extremely controllable, as we all know. For example, when modeling and rendering, the artist can explicit, explicitly specify every object in the scene, every light source, texture, material, camera. Uh, when we create animations, every joint can be controlled. When you move to neural rendering, many of these human understandable elements might disappear. Uh, now, for example, instead of meshes, you might be dealing with abstract parameter spaces. And it is much trickier to introduce meaningful control knobs to an abstract space. Uh, there are a few ways one can go about introducing controllability. All have been tried to various degrees, but all can be definitely further explored. Uh, first off, don't learn everything, right? We've seen examples of that today. It might be beneficial to move away from a completely learned, completely opaque system to a hybrid system in which some parts are learned and some are fixed. And in such hybrid system, the, the fixed, you mean interpret, interpretable pieces can be used to add controllability. Second strategy is to introduce controllability is by learning an abstract space and then assigning meaning and controllability to the space in retrospect using a few label examples. Uh, for example, in an abstract space that represents faces, we can search for and find a gradient direction that adds or removes smiles. Just one example. Uh, lastly, control can be baked into the network, and we've seen examples of that too. Uh, into the network architecture and, and also into the training procedure. So if a neural rendering system is trained in such a way, uh, that some of the inputs are human interpretable, then those can be used in inference time to introduce meaningful controllability. Uh, just to drive the point home, the point home, there are many uh, pieces that can be learned and we really need to make informed decisions. Uh, if you think about classical rendering, all these elements, geometry, material, camera, lighting, texture, others, they all take part in the rendering process and all of these can be learned from data in some form of, or another. The interesting question to me is, for a given application, which ones should we learn? And as I said before, how do we combine these fixed and learned representations to help the network generalize and introduce controllability? In the paper, we list many other open challenges, for example, multimodal neural scene representation. I'm not going to go into this today, but please yeah, check out the paper if you're interested. Before I conclude, I would like to briefly mention the social implications of neural rendering. I'm a great believer that we must be extremely mindful to the broader impact of our research on society. Uh, specifically for neural rendering, while many of these methods we surveyed are mostly irreproachable, some, especially those related to humans and human synthesis, they have legitimate and extremely useful use cases, but can also be used for a nefarious man in a nefarious manner. Uh, think about fake news. For example, uh, for brevity, I'm not going to go into too much details. Please refer to the paper for that. But I would like to at least mention a few best practices in terms of uh, social implications. What can we do? Uh, first off, uh, synthesized content should be clearly presented as synthetic when we share it broadly. This might be obvious from context or using an embedded label or informative descriptions. 
And also whenever a human is being synthesized, artists should obtain permission both from the content owner and also from the person which is being synthesized. We also believe that foren- forensic efforts are extremely important. And indeed, we are involved in forensic research to detect, detect synthetic content and verify uh, authentic media. Uh, now, many mitigations are not at all technological. They instead have to do with law and policy making. So we should all take part in such discussions to make them more useful and grounded in current technological abilities. And lastly, I would urge each and every one of you, when relevant, to explicitly address social implications of your research. I'm not sure we do that enough as a community. Uh, this can be a section in your paper, a blog post, any other method that will help explain why the research is pursued and guide its applications in the direction that you believe to be a good one. Okay, let's do a short recap of uh, what you've heard today. Uh, We talked about the definition of neural rendering and the importance of controllability in that definition. We saw representative applications from five different categories, semantic photosynthesis, novel view synthesis, free viewpoint video relighting, and facial body reenactment. And of course, there are many open challenges of which we talked about generalization and editability. We briefly mentioned multimodal representations, and there are more in the paper. Uh, we truly believe and hopefully manage to somewhat convince you today that neural rendering has the potential to impact numerous challenges in both computer graphics and computer vision. Uh, with that, I would like to thank everyone for listening, thank all the speakers, and open it up for uh, questions. Thank you very much. Hey, so um, we just checked, we didn't see a question so far um, in the Discord and we actually already are a bit over time. So maybe we can conclude here. Um, So maybe everyone can enable their webcam so we can see everyone um, for last group photo. Um, Great, awesome. So yeah, to to conclude, um, I I want to thank all of my collaborators. Um, This was really, as Ohad said, like a big, big effort collaboratively, and it was really great to work with all of you. Um, Thanks to everybody watching. Um, If you you have any questions for us um, after this, please feel to drop us an email or post it in the Discord channel. We will stick around for a while. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you.